I'm thankful for that. If you would turn with me to uh, James chapter number one, James chapter number one, <clears throat> and I won't take up too much of your time tonight, but there's just been uh, some thoughts here on my heart and mind. And so I want to read to you from James chapter number one, beginning there with verse number one. The Bible reads, these are the words of God. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, can it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience? Amen. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then look at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, Amen. which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. I want to talk briefly to you tonight uh, from James chapter number 1 concerning the idea of blessed endurance. Blessed endurance. James Amen. says, blessed is he that endures. Amen. Uh, you know, we, we live in a really unprecedented time in Christian history. On the one hand, never before have we as Christians experienced so much liberty and freedom Yet so little persecution. Mm -hmm. I realize that there are places in the world where Christians are being intensely persecuted. But for the most part, in most countries, especially the United States of America, right. we have freedom like the people of God have never known. Amen. Now, where that's going to go in the next 10 years or 15 years, we don't know. But for right now, and I believe the Lord calls us to be people of the day, people of today, to live in the moment, we have liberty. Mm -hmm. However, because of our abuse of that liberty, or rather I should say misuse of that liberty, or, or flat out lack of use right. of that liberty, to not take advantage, if you want to put it that way, of the grace that God has given us. I mean, think about it. When, when Paul was under all the intense Roman persecution, he was starting churches left and right. Amen. Souls were getting saved left and right. I understand Amen. he was an apostle. But the same grace that was extended to him through Christ is available to anyone today that would consecrate themselves the way he did. Hmm. So how come under all that persecution and hardship, Paul was able to get so much done for the Lord, yet we, who live in this unprecedented time of liberty, sit on our hands and twiddle our thumbs? Right. Well, this misuse of liberty <coughs> has wrought some serious consequences. You're right. There was an author, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but he said something really interesting. I don't believe he was a Christian. But he said this. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. Hmm. And I believe what we're seeing in America today and in the church, sadly is that the good times that God has given us is starting to produce weak men right. that have never had to endure, that have never had to stick it out. And these weak men, because they sat on their hands and twiddled their thumbs together, are now creating hard times. Right. But the, the question that, that we are to ask Is could it be that God, just as he has done in times past, is allowing these mm -hmm. temptations and allowing these trials and allowing these hard times in order to accomplish a greater purpose, i.e., create some more hard men and women? Mm -hmm. Right. 
Paul said, in your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And I think that's what James is getting at here. He's giving some directives to believers who find themselves in the midst of hard times. And so there's several things I want to show you from this text. The first is this, the reality considered. The reality considered. Look at verse number two. James says, my brethren. So he identifies who he is writing to. The Bible is not written to the lost man. Right. The Bible is written to the Christian. Right. Now the Bible is for all men, but it's not to all men. Hmm. He says, my brethren, he's writing to believers. And here is the reality. He said, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an if. It's not a maybe. But it's a win. Right. James says, you will have these diverse, uh, that's a King James word for a variety, many different kinds mm -hmm. of temptations. And these temptations, in keeping with the context of this passage, because he's writing to the brethren, mm -hmm. these temptations are not temptations sent from the devil, tempting you to sin. But these temptations are trials of your faith sent by God himself. Amen. And we have to understand that the word temptation has different definitions. Because the Bible also says, and in the same book nonetheless, that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither he tempteth any man. That's in reference to temptation to sin. Amen. This is not in reference to temptation to sin. This is a trial of our faith. There you go. And this word refers to a testing, to a proving, uh, to an opportunity, to a stage upon which we can prove ourselves faithful or unfaithful. And oftentimes, these temptations, these trials, originate from good things. Things like marriage, hmm. things like family, things like jobs, things like church, things like school, friendships. Oftentimes, these good blessings are the source of hard temptation and trial. And they give us a platform, and they give us a, an opportunity to examine and strengthen our faith. Mm -hmm. These are opportunities for us to mature as believers. And therefore, James says, we should desire these things in our lives. Mm -hmm. We shrink away from these things. Right. We don't want them. But as we're going to see as we keep on reading down into the text, these are good things. Mm -hmm. This is the perspective we are to have. So we should desire them. But whether you desire them or not, James says, you're going to have them. Mm -hmm. So we might as well learn to desire them. Amen. Because we're going to have it. Count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptation. So the reality that we just considered is that you, the brethren, will have trials all throughout the Christian life. Uh, one guy said, if you're a Christian, you're either going into, about to go into, or coming out of a trial of mm -hmm. some kind. That's the reality considered. But here, I want you to see the response commanded. The response commanded. See, how a person responds to trials of his faith reveals the strength of his faith. And because temptations are inevitable, James writes to these believers and instructs them on how they are to respond to them. And there's three ways from this text that you are commanded to respond to these trials and temptations. The first is this, a joyful attitude. A joyful attitude. Mm -hmm. Where is the battle in the Christian life? The battle is in the mind. We want, as the people of God and, and as ministers of the gospel, my desire is that God would use my preaching and teaching to cause Christians to think Biblically. Mm -hmm. 
Have a joyful attitude. Think biblically about these things that come into your life. James says, count it all joy. Mm -hmm. Now what's really impressive about this commandment is that this is not a natural response to troubling circumstances. Uh, this idea to count it all joy, it's not talking about numerically counting, but to count means to evaluate something within a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And see, we don't rejoice in the temptations in and of themselves, but we rejoice for the temptations because we see the bigger picture and we realize that these trials, these tests, this temptation are all part of a bigger picture that God is doing something with us. Amen. And when we identify these things as sent from Him, we are commanded to rejoice. We're not joyous because something bad has happened to us or because a hard providence or difficult circumstance has come into our path. But we rejoice because we know that this one instance of bad is all part of God's overarching plan for the good of His people. Amen. Because God said, though it's often taken out of context, it is in the Bible, that all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen. My wife was baking today in preparation for Thanksgiving. And there she had in her mixing bowl, she had some raw eggs and some butter, and some flour, and some sugar, and spices. Now all of those things by themselves are not good. Right. You don't want to eat any of those things by themselves. But when she mixes them up, and she puts them all together, and she pours them in the baking pan, and she puts them in the oven, they all work together for good. That's it. Amen. That's how we are to view these trials. I'm very thankful that we have eggs in our fridge. I'm thankful we have butter in the fridge. I'm thankful there's flour in the cabinet. Right. Because all those things work together for good. And they make delicious pumpkin pies. Amen. <laughs> and I, I want you to turn here to Ephesians chapter number 5. And if you would, permit me to get a little philosophical for a second. Ephesians chapter number 5. We see this commanded alongside the text there in James. Ephesians chapter number 5, and look at verse 20. The Bible says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God Amen. and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he says, giving thanks always for all things. Mm -hmm. not, not just the good things, not some things, but for all all things. And notice who the object of this thanksgiving is. It's God. Amen. We're to thank God for everything that happens to us, everything we receive, everything we don't receive. We're to thank God. Now, why are we to thank God? Well, if I asked Adam to bring me some water, and Adam brought me some water, I would not thank Jared for the water. Right. Because Jared didn't give it to me. So if I'm to thank God for all things, then it must be God who ordains and decrees and brings to pass all things. Amen. How can God be thanked for something God didn't do? But because He did all things, and before the foundation of the world ordained all things, we thank Him for all things. Amen. Now you say, well, doesn't that make God the author of sin? and the originator of evil. No, it does not. Because the sins that God decrees to come to pass and the evil that He ordains are never the ultimate end. But they are always a means to an end. Amen. Now you say, well then why don't I give thanks to God always for all things? How come I get frustrated and upset? And, right. and why do I have an unthankful heart? Well, because I'm not spiritual yet. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Not that sanctified. But the proper response to all things is thanks. Amen. Unto God. Amen. Let me give you a, a good example of, of something that was in and of itself very evil, absolutely wicked, the most heinous crime that's ever been committed, 
Yet you thank God for it every day. I'm talking about the cross of Calvary. Right. The greatest atrocity that's ever happened on planet Earth. The, the murder of the darling Son of God. Yet you pray to God and thank Him for the cross. Yet you sing about the glory of the cross. You give praise to God for killing His own Son on the cross. Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? Because you recognize that the purpose of Calvary was not merely to put to death the Lord Jesus, but through His death, His people would be saved and redeemed. Amen. And so we thank God for that. Uh, and that's how we're to look at all things. Mm -hmm. We're to look at all things through the lens of Calvary, through the lens of God's good providence for His people. Amen. And we could think of some personal examples. Because all of us here lately have gone through some of these things. When we get a call that a relative is having some health issues, is having to go to the ER, do we give thanks to God for that? Mm. Well, some, even believers, would, would think it to be absurd to give thanks to God for such a thing. Right. <laughs> but we who trust a good God and His providence, we should give thanks to God for all things, Amen. even if we don't understand how it's working together for good, but we trust that it is, Amen. and we thank Him for it. Amen. A joyous attitude. Mm. Think of some of the evils that we're called to fight. Mm. Do you give thanks? And notice he says, giving thanks to God for all things, not in spite of all things. See, oftentimes we like to, to play it around, and when something bad happens, our prayer is, well, thank you, Lord, that it wasn't worse. Now, there's validity to that. I understand that. But men, if your wife brings out supper that she cooked for you, and she asks you, honey, how was it? He said, well, thank you, honey. This could be a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Wrong answer, guys. Right. <laughs> no, thank you for this supper. Mm -hmm. We need to learn how to be thankful for the things God does. Not just the restraints that he gives, though we're thankful for that too, but we're thankful for the things that he does. I'm not, I'm not thankful simply because Millions of babies are slaughtered each year in America, but I'm thankful that God has given me this dragon to fight. Amen. Given the church this evil to stand against. I'm not thankful that wicked men are being elected to rule in our country, mm. but I am thankful that God has raised up these men, if for no other reason than to inspire his church to make an even more bold stand for righteousness Amen. and the things of God. A joyous attitude in all things. Giving thanks to God for all things. A joyous attitude, number one. Second, we're, we are to respond to these temptations with an understanding mind. And this kind of piggybacks off of that first reason. Go back to James chapter number one. James chapter number 1. And look at verse 3. He says, <clears throat> knowing this. See, our faith in God has to be based on who He has revealed Himself to be in His Word. And if we are to respond with thankfulness and with joy, we have to do so based upon some kind of knowledge of God and His plan for us. Mm -hmm. And when your faith is an empty profession... When it's based simply on feeling and not on biblical fact, you're not going to be able to stand against these temptations. If you have a faulty view of God and God's desire for His people, temptations won't make sense to you. You know, many in America today and in other places too, they have this idea and the health, wealth, prosperity gospel teaches them right. that God wants you to be happy and healthy all the time. Mm -hmm. 
happy and healthy and wealthy, no worries and no cares. That's what God wants you to be. That's the will of God for your life. Mm -hmm. And so when a trial comes, when a hard time comes, they say, oh, that's got to be the devil. That, this is a bad thing. I don't want this thing in my life. I want this thing out of my life. That can't be from God because God wants me to be happy all the time. And this thing could bring me pain. This thing could bring me suffering. What if God, instead of wanting you to be happy, first wants you to be holy? Mm -hmm. Ah, if you understand that, then those temptations begin to make sense. And thankfully, God has not left us in the dark Amen. concerning what He desires from us. Did He not say in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, this is the will of God, even your sanctification? Mm -hmm. He didn't say even your happiness. This is the will of God, even a big bank account. Mm. But this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And sometimes God sends things into our lives. He sends these hard providences that shake us, that rattle us, that make us unhappy, that make us sad, that expend our finances, that take our health, that take our, our peace. Sanctify us. Amen. Amen. Knowing this. We have, but we have to have an understanding mind in order to comprehend why God is doing these things. Thirdly, the, la the last thing that you are commanded to respond to these temptations is a submissive will. He says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then he says this, but let patience have her perfect work. Amen. Focus on, on this phrase, let patience. Let patience. Now, this work of patience, it is a process. And it is a process that God calls us to yield to. He says, let it. Mm -hmm. Allow this to work in your life. Don't fight against this, but invite it to work in your life. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about an autonomous free will, but I'm talking about after you're redeemed, because James is writing to the brethren, Amen. after you're redeemed, and God has given you a new nature, cooperate with and yield to, as Paul says in Romans 6, yield to the Spirit and cooperate with this work of patience in your Amen. life, because Amen. the trying of your faith worketh patience, and let patience have her perfect work. The work of patience is a progressive, process that happens to us in stages through the means of these trials and temptations. Amen. And it's like gold refined in a furnace. Those temptations come and, and we get put in that fiery furnace and we might melt down in the furnace. Amen. There's nothing wrong. Listen. Because I, I think I think there's two sides of the ditch that you can go off on when, when Christians talk about when Christians talk about uh, uh, the, the depression and the oppression mm -hmm. and, and the mental problems that we face as believers and the emotional problems. There's two sides of the ditch. The one side uh, is to say that uh, the, the spiritual aspect of that it, it, it's all it's all just medical and clinical and you need to treat it with a pill just like the world does. Mm -hmm. That's, that's one ditch that I think we need to avoid. But here's the other ditch. The other ditch is saying that all of depression and oppression and, and, and emotional fatigue, that's all just sinful aspects of your life that you need to repent of. Listen, there's nothing wrong with a temptation putting you in the fiery furnace. There's nothing wrong with having a meltdown. Hmm. So long... As you harden back up when you come out of that furnace. That's it. That, that's what happens to gold. It goes in that furnace and it melts down. But then it comes out and it's harder than it was before it went in. And then the next temptation comes in your life. And you go back in that furnace. And you might melt down. But you're going to come back harder. More pure. More refined. On the other side. Amen. 
But you have to let patience have a perfect work with you. Amen. You have to welcome this process in your life. We have to trust God to be working these things in our life, even when we don't understand them, even when they're uncomfortable. And this submissive will is a lifelong characteristic of a Christian. See, because God cannot work through us until He's worked in us. Amen. Uh, just like that gold and the, that, that silver and precious stone, it's not ready to be made into jewelry, to be put on a ring, its final resting place, until it's gone through that process of being melted and hardened, and melted and hardened. Amen. And, and if you are to one day be a gem in the royal crown of redemption of King Jesus, then he's going to refine you. He, he's going to make you what he wants you to be. And he toughens us up so that we can serve him. He hardens us so that we won't capitulate when a harder trial comes. Amen. Think about it in your own life. When you face something and you think, by God's grace, I remember five years ago when the Lord brought me through a similar situation and he gave me grace then and he taught me some things that have equipped me to be able to handle the present situation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps 2020 has been a preparation for God's people so that we can handle 2024. Right. And then in 2024, we're going to be repenting for all the complaining we've done in the last 12 months. And Amen. we're going to be thanking God that He allowed us to experience those hard things because they strengthened us and taught us and prepared us to handle 2024. Amen. That's the way the Lord works. And we have to have an understanding mind if we are to have that outlook. Amen. Then He says this, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Perfect, not meaning sinless perfection, but perfect, meaning mature, entire, complete. God is not giving us these trials so that He can keep us beaten down and run down, but He's doing this so He can train us. Amen. That's why we desire them. So that we can be wanting of nothing. I, I, I'm always humbled when I meet someone, uh, perhaps a missionary, that's spent most of their life doing Christian service outside of the United States. Because they learn what it really means to be wanting of nothing. Yep. They, they know what it means to want nothing because they've had to live on nothing. And perhaps the Lord is taking away some of these amenities that were vestiges of the good times in order to wean us off of these things so when we don't have them anymore, we can go on fighting for God, mm -hmm. persevering for God. Amen. I was, I was sitting at the Volkswagen dealership today and I uh, was getting my car worked on and a lady was talking to me and uh, we were talking about our, our vehicles and just the different problems with them and I was telling her I, I hope my car got fixed because I do a lot of traveling and, and uh, I've got to go to Pennsylvania for Thanksgiving. And she said, well, what do you do all the traveling for? So I said, well, uh, I'm a preacher. I travel around. I've preached all over the country this year. And she said, have you ever been overseas anywhere? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, last summer I went to India. She said, wow, India. She said, that must have been hot. I said, actually it was about 110 every day. And I recounted a story in which there were, was a, a handful of Christians at a village church that sat in that 110 degree weather outside for six hours waiting to come and hear us preach. Amen. And the woman said, you know, she said, in America, if the air conditioner doesn't work at the church building, we just cancel the services. Right. My mind. Perhaps God is allowing us to experience some of these things 
some of these hardships to get a taste of it so that if by God's grace we have to go through extended periods of that kind of thing, we'll be able to do it. Amen. Because we've let patience have a perfect work that we can be perfect and entire wanting nothing. But I don't want to leave you on that note of, uh, of hard times that are coming. Because even if hard times do come, I believe that they will only be temporary. Because I believe the gospel will ultimately be victorious. Amen. But I want to leave you with this thought. Remember, we read verse 12. We've looked at the reality considered, the response commanded. And now, lastly, as we close, I want you to, to see the reward coming. The reward coming. Verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of of life. Amen. Which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now notice he receives that when he is tried. Well, you know that the crown of life is not something you receive in this life, but it's something you receive when your trial is over. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this life is characterized by trial. However, when this life is over, the trials of your faith will be over too. Why? You won't have any need of faith. Because your faith will be sight. Amen. Amen. And you will see him face to face. And you will receive the crown of life. Amen. Uh, you know, I don't believe we'll be passive. I, I, I believe we're going to be very active in heaven. Why else would we need a glorified body? Why else would we be wearing crowns? Mm -hmm. I believe Amen. we're going to be active in the praise of God, Amen. in the worship of God, Amen. and in the work of God. But because that faith will be sight, there will be no more need for trial. Amen. Oh, imagine the liberty of being able to serve God, to be able to do the work of God, to be able to worship God without all the trials and struggles of this life. Amen. Oh, how I've often thought, how wonderful would it be Oh, if I could just study the Bible, do the work of the ministry, never have to worry about car trouble, <laughs> never have to worry about finances, never have to worry about sickness. But then I, then I remember my earthly ministry. I'm a young man, but at best, my earthly ministry's got maybe 50 more years on it, 40 more years on it, something like that. Who knows? Lord knows. Might have a couple more weeks on it. <clears throat> but my eternal ministry shall have no end. Amen. So God has given me this earthly ministry, this very short earthly ministry, with all of these trials to prepare me for that eternal ministry. Amen. All of you, not, not just preachers, pastors, or deacons, all of you, men, women, all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you have an eternal ministry. There will be a place for you in the kingdom of God, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, working for the Lord Jesus Christ, doing the work of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. And he's given you this life, this life of trial, this life of affliction, this life of hardship, so that you will be fit and ready to wear that crown of life. Amen. And serve him for eternity. And, and let me leave you with this illustration. I know I've given it to you before, this story rather, that of John Bunyan. You know, John Bunyan was arrested November 12th, 1660. And John Bunyan went to preach knowing that a warrant had been issued for his arrest because he preached Baptist convictions. Mm -hmm. And he was taken into custody right after he opened his Bible and read the text of his message. So he left home knowing that a warrant had been issued for his arrest, and he got in the pulpit, opened the Bible, read the passage, and they came up and arrested him while he was in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. You know, John Bunyan went on to spend 12 years in prison. He was separated from his wife and his four young children. Mm. 
And he recounted the harshness of his stay. You know, in that time period, prisons did not provide you with any food, with any money, with any health care. So his wife, in addition to raising four children on her own, would come to the prison and give him what food she could give him, care for him as she could. But he eventually came to the conviction that the Christian life was just like Esther in the perfuming chamber, being made ready for the presence of the king. Amen. And you know that in that prison state, he went on to write Pilgrim's Progress? That's it. And John Bunyan was convinced that the reason why God allowed him to spend 12 years in prison was to prepare him for the greater ministry that he was to have forever with Jesus. Amen. It shall be worth it all when we see Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your grace. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to give thanks for all things to you. Lord, I confess that I don't do this as I ought to do it. And Lord, I pray that you would help me and those here to respond to all things that come to us with an attitude <coughs> of joy. Lord, that we would thank you for the good things, for the bad things, for the happy things and for the sad things, knowing that all things that come to pass in our life are ultimately for our good, good that we might be better servants of you. Father, we love you because you first loved us. We ask your grace upon us. Lord, in this season of thanksgiving, help us to truly be thankful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.